Welcome, everyone. Welcome and thank you for embarking on our uh, fifth and last day of conference held at the University of Oxford. I am Justine Meyerheisen, and I would like to improvise a few words by way of conclusion in this Zoom marathon week devoted to the combination of two topical themes, utopia and migration, before I leave the floor to the last but not least talk by Ashim Mambe. Combining utopianism and pragmatism, literary analysis, social theory, and philosophy, together, scholars in the humanities and social sciences, writers, movie directors from Africa, the US, Asia, and Europe, we have tried to address one of the biggest and most urging challenges of all time, how to solve the problems arising from mass displacement on a sole and unique planet that it partitioned by established borders. This question was asked two years and a half ago when we launched the call for papers. Two years later, in the middle of a pandemic, this question takes more density. However, differently we register the pandemic, it reminds us that we are implicated in a shared world on the same boat. Each and every one is involved in its survival. Yet, it reminds us that the shared world is not equally shared. The pandemic has illuminated and intensified racial and economic inequalities at the same time that it heightens the global sense of our obligations to one another and the earth. So together, we have tried to open our minds to imaginative concrete solutions from fiction to contemporary migration adapting our talks to this new reality. Together, we have thought and felt. Emotions were sometimes overwhelming, an intellectual emotion that changes our perspectives and shapes or a certain intensity of attention. An intellectual emotion which can lead to consideration as a political and legal task, because only those who, whose lives are not considered to be bereaved and therefore valuable are burdened by precarity, legal incapacitation, and a differential exposure to violence and death. Together, we have acknowledged art and literature as a possible political scene outside politics that demands visibility, recognition, and responsibility for those who are seeking asylum in the hope of being able to live a life that demands the liberation of refugees from categories which borders impose on them, that demands the right to exile and the right to stay, the right to leave and the right to return. Borders have been approached here as lines of encounters, boundings and passages, but above all, and sadly, in the reality of the 21st century, in the reality of a neoliberal age, borders as lines of tensions, conflicts, and separation. Because the crisis becomes one when it is appropriate for the states to make us think so. If anti-migrant resentment has become a primary political argument, mobilizations from civil society in favor of vulnerable migrants have at the same time path, paved the path for new forms of citizen participation. Among this movement of reflection, protest, and resistance, art and literature have emerged as attempts to modify the citizen perceptions on migration dynamics. As such, utopia appeared to be a powerful tool to condemn abusive representations of migrants and renew the collective imagination of migration in order to transform our relationship to hospitality. As such, utopia mobilize metaphors which provide a representational truth. They make us see the world in such a way that we can discover and recognize it at the same time. As such, utopia is thus less an island than an archipelago, less a black hole than a constellation, less a place than a network, a flow where new concepts and pr principles emerge from each other Refugia, ecotone, metaspora, and so on. As such, utopia seems to lie in the collective aspect of its movement, which extends the scope and true political meaning of democracy itself. 
Utopia does not set itself the aim to end politics, but rather to elaborate a most fertile and paradoxical or dialectical way, a new, a new node of tension of possibilities. The invention of politics from the art and literature always renewed beyond the state, even against it, which is the hallmark of utopia, according to Miguel Abenso. If this is the new awakening of utopia in the 21st century, may this impetus help us to reimagine a home for all forms of life, free of will all relations of domination. It is not too late. You see, this is not a conclusion. Vous n'avez aucune note. That was Siri. <laughs> you see, this is not a conclusion. I prefer this week to end with an opening from a unique source of inspiration. Ashin Membe. Achille, thank you for being with us. Achille, Achille Membe is professor of history and political sciences, researcher of the Witz Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. The recipient of numerous awards, including the Ernst Bloch Prize in 2018. The author of Sortir de la Grande Nuit, Critique de la Raison Nègre, Politique de l'Inimitié et Brutalisme, to name a few in French. He is also the initiator with Fedwin Sarr of the Atelier de la Pensée de Dakar, a consortium of researchers, philosophers, politicians, writers, and artists invited to come together to take a pluralistic look at the realities of the African continent and the futures it gives itself from a place, Africa. Ashin Membe is well known as one of the world's most profound, incisive, and bold critical minds of all time. Each one of his texts astounds us as it opens our eyes to the, the already there, which we then blame ourselves for having missed, but also to what will be if we do nothing. Ashin Membe's writing does more than expose and does more than condemn. It inspires. And this is how I would like to introduce him, a source of hope. His work reconstructs critical theories, historical and philosophical framework for expanding our sense of the futures for the whole living. It makes it possible by reparation, by taking care of what has been broken, what has been broken by the colony, the post-colony, the empire, the Anthropocene, the necropolitics, well, systems, systems based on the principle of separation opposing reparation to separation. Ashim Membe does it by reinvesting utopias through the reenchantment, the revaluation of a politics of care while the hearth is damaged and the creation of spaces of free circulation. Himself is inspired by writers and philosophers such as Amos Tutuola, Sonila Boutancier, Mé Césaire, Franz Fanon, or Edouard Glissant. With them, Ashim Membe emphasizes the role of imagination and particularly of literature in the creation of tomorrow's utopias. Art is understood as a well of possibilities to rethink contemporary migrations and reimagining other alternative models to the current neoliberal model. Faced with the criminalization of circulation, the plundering of resources and the violence of contemporary brutalism, Membe calls for a politics of care capable of including from Africa the question of the common good and the sharing of the earth. Ashim Membe, the floor is all yours. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Justine. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, and uh, and your team, because I, I know that there's a whole team uh, behind you. Um, thank you for for inviting me to uh, uh, to this uh, this conference. I um, I have to start by um, confessing that uh, I, I do not um, work on on migration uh, per se. Um, but but over the last uh, 
six to seven years, um, I have developed um, a keen interest in, in the question of uh, bodies as borders. Uh, bodies as borders in the context of, uh, um, let's just call it the new age and the new epoch we live in. I'm referring to um, a, a new age and uh, a new epoch, but I'm mindful of um, a point uh, Carl Schmitt uh, made not so long ago in his uh, Nomos of the Earth, which is uh, an influential text. Uh, many started reading again uh, at the beginning of what was then called uh, the, uh, the War on Terror, um, which in fact, uh, by the way, coincided with, uh, I would argue, uh, a new face uh, in the, uh, the short history of, of neoliberalism. And that, uh, that new phase coincided itself with the thematic of war uh, is uh, uh, an interesting point. Uh, some have looked into, have in mind, uh, the latest work by Maurizio Lazzarato, uh, for instance. So the point Schmidt was making was that, uh, and I quote him, every new age and every new epoch is founded on new spatial divisions, new enclosures, and new spatial orders, end of uh, quotation. What Schmidt seems to suggest is that uh, divisions, uh, partitions, enclaves, enclosures are in fact ways in which we create borders ways in which we institutionalize borders. We bring them into existence. And at the same time, they take on a life of their own. That double process, borders are invented and they invent something else in turn. So borders in turn are one key way in which we order space or spaces. And let's just put it like that. And in ordering uh, spaces, we almost automatically order movement. And in ordering movement, we almost automatically order bodies too. There's uh, interest in this question of bodies as borders. So if you want, my own way of addressing the question of migration in our times has been in terms of uh, how to think together spatial reordering, the reordering of movement and of bodies in our times. Times which, uh, as uh, Justine suggested, have been given, of course, various names, names such as uh, neoliberalism, the Anthropocene, brutalism uh, to mention, but uh, a few. Now to be sure, uh, neoliberalism, the Anthropocene and brutalism uh, are not exactly 
the same thing. But something is common to them, uh, taken uh, all together. In the sense that they, uh, they all, they each uh, refer to an overwhelming fact of our age, the fact that this is an age when everything is up for grabs. That's what, how I would des describe or define uh, the moment we live in. A moment when everything or almost everything is up for grabs, starting with the earth itself, starting with the planet we live in. So I'm therefore going to comment not on any specific case study, but on a, a set of larger processes, processes having to do with the reordering of space, the reordering of bodies, and the reordering of movement at a time when everything is up for grabs. By which I mean a time when the earth is segmented anew, re-territorialized if you want, a time when the earth is parceled out and redistributed and reappropriated by all kinds of, of forces. So my contention is that all over the world, the combination of uh, fossil-based capitalism and the uh, saturation of the everyday by digital and computational technologies, this combination has led to the acceleration of speed. It has also led to the intensification of connections. But even more decisively, it has unleashed a new cycle in the long history of partition and redistribution of the earth. A long history of which ongoing migrations, population movements, transfers and relocations are but some of the uh, uh, most dramatic, if you want, uh, illustrations. In other words, populations worldwide are being redefined and territorially marked. And these processes of redefinition, of parceling out and of marking, these processes are having the most enduring impact on the nature of their lives as well as uh, livelihoods. And more importantly, they are part of uh, a new distribution of the earth uh, in a context in which new kinds of uh, apparatuses of capture or appropriation of the earth's lands and resources are, are being uh, uh, designed and redesigned. So to some extent, what is going on is not unlike many of the problems that uh, someone like Hannah Arendt identified during the first half of the, uh, the 20th century, many of which, uh, in fact, uh, are still with us. As you remember, Arendt uh, saw the stateless, she was very much um, interested in 
the stateless, she saw them as, uh, as modern pariahs and her reflections on the stateless uh, continue in, indeed to, uh, to frame uh, current debates on, on hospitality, on, on human rights, on, on responsibility. But there is a difference with, between now and uh, Arendt's times. The difference is that today, the uh, emergence of uh, new varieties of, of racism uh, in, in the US, uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere, the, uh, <clears throat> the reassertion of uh, uh, global white supremacy, uh, of uh, populism, uh, retro-nationalism, the uh, weaponization of difference and identity are not only symptoms of uh, a deep distrust of the world, they are also fostered by transnational forces, forces which are capable of making the world inhospitable and inhabitable and unbreathable uh, for many. While, of course, national security and the state of exception increasingly place refugees and migrants uh, at the borders of international law. When, when they are not literally expelled from the strictures of uh, international law. So one key uh, conclusion one can draw along Arendtian line is that uh, without a recognition of our common humanity and our shared world, uh, sovereign states, will continue uh, to find exceptions uh, to the legal status of refugees and migrants, thus enabling their exclusion uh, from political life and uh, from the very laws that should protect them. Another difference with Aaron's times has to do with the fact that in this new dispensation, to be alive or to remain alive or to survive is increasingly tantamount to being able to move, being able to get out or to get in and to do so speedily when the time comes. In other words, mobility and speed have become critical resources in any politics of survival, or for that matter, in any politics of life in our times. And this process will only intensify as uh, technological escalation, uh, algorithmic capitalism, and the combustion of the earth collide. The fact is that uh, the human race has come up against terrestrial limits. I think that uh, such limits are not uh, only the consequence of the uh, sphericality of, of the planet. They are also uh, limitations on uh, the expansion of life as such. And as the planet increasingly seems uh, bound to, to burn, it, it is not only the individuated bodies which are imperiled, 
it is earthly existence, the fate of everything on earth, the, uh, the fluidity of life, uh, which is uh, at stake. And life in, the, in extreme conditions uh, is more and more likely to become uh, the norm, uh, weaving life in inhospitable conditions, in, in conditions of unlivability will become uh, the new normal. So I wanted to share that first set of comments, if only to uh, provide you with, let's say, the uh, overall context uh, of uh, the reflections I would like to uh, make tonight. Let me now move to a second set of comments. And these ones have to do with what seems to me to be the key features of the new nomos of the earth I have uh, been talking about. I already mentioned the fact that more than ever before at any other time uh, in human history. Not only are we in close proximity to each other, but we are also more than ever before exposed to each other. And yet, uh, wherever we look, the drive is simultaneously towards containment, towards enclosure, towards uh, various forms of encampment, uh, detention, and incarceration. Typical of this logic of uh, containment and incarceration and enclosure is, for instance, the worldwide erection of all kinds of walls and fortifications, gates and enclaves, to which uh, should be added uh, various practices of offloading people, evicting and expelling them, offshoring and fencing off wealth itself, uh, splintering territories, fragmenting spaces, saddling them with various kinds of borders, borders whose uh, function is to decelerate movement, to stop it in some instances for certain classes of populations in order we are told to manage risks. And as it happens, physical and virtual barriers of, of separation, uh, digitalization of databases, filing systems, the development of new tracking devices, uh, sensors, drones, satellites, sentinel robots, infrared detectors, biometric controls, and new microchips containing personal details, everything is put in place to transform the very nature of the border in the name of security. So to put it succinctly, in the new nomos of the earth, borders are increasingly turned into mobile, into portable, into omnipresent and ubiquitous realities. They are no longer merely lines of demarcation separating distinct sovereign entities. They are increasingly the name we should use to describe the uh, organized violence that underpins both contemporary capitalism and uh, world order 
uh, in in general. Significant in this regard is one of the crucial developments in the last few decades, which has had to do indeed with the development of uh, border technologies. One of the major consequences of the acceleration of technological innovations in the last few uh, decades has been, as you uh, well know, the creation, I would argue, of a segmented planet of multiple speed regimes. I would like to highlight the importance three sets of border technologies and related bordering practices uh, that have uh, accompanied these new developments. First is what is known as technologies of uh, biometric inscription, technologies having to do with uh, parts of the body, such as the face, such as skin, such as uh, uh, irises. And these uh, technologies of biometric inscription are centered on the biometric detection and datification of bodily traits. They range from the digital fingerprints that make up, for instance, the uh, European Union's Eurodac database. Uh, they include uh, DNA testing, which is imposed on migrant families of specific racialized backgrounds. They include iris scans, as well as uh, various facial recognition technologies. The goal here is to read data off the bodies of people on the move. In other words, the aim is to convert embodied indexes, such as skin, fingerprints, facial traits, retinas, irises, DNA, is to convert them into data doubles, data doubles which are then stored in networked bases uh, in order to profile, to track and surveil unwanted mobile individuals. So that's the first set of uh, border technologies which have a huge impact on, let's say, the uh, the fact of, of migration. The second set of technologies mostly consists of uh, <clears throat> new algorithmic modes of, of sensing, new algorithmic modes of, of tracking movements. And this second set of technologies range from ground sensors that carry out uh, surface crossing detection, radar, infrared, and thermal uh, imaging. It also includes uh, geolocation tracking, gesture and gait recognition softwares, softwares which uh, focus on the more intimate scale of individual bodily movements uh, and gestures, once again, for uh, profiling purposes. Then there is a third set of technologies which include the um, introduction of latest forms of mobile military surveillance uh, into larger practices of uh, border control, uh, such is the case, uh, for instance, of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or, or drones. Um, and manned aerostats and ground vehicles uh, initi initially um, 
employed uh, in the fields of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, and uh, now in many other places uh, in, in the world. So overall, the uh, ongoing segmentation of the planet can now be seen in terms of the um, algorithmic form that border control and governance uh, is, uh, is taking. And uh, it is very clear that uh, these algorithms enact particular forms of uh, racialization. And this too is uh, a key aspect, I would argue, of the new nomos of the earth. Uh, the the uh, relocation of racist animus in technologies of various kinds. So what I have done in this second set of observations is to go in some detail in showing the ways in which the re-territorialization of the earth of our planet today is uh, a precondition for uh, the regulation of, of movements, of migration, if you want, and the extent to which this is related to a body that is increasingly dissected. Dissected in the sense that uh, to each of its uh, specific organs is attached a specific uh, technological uh, index, uh, if, if you want. So, as you can deduce from what I have said, border security practices have taken nowadays a very keen interest in the connection between the human body, technology, and identity. All with the purpose of achieving detailed control of a movement and speed. Not the movement of every single human being, but movement and speed of certain classes of population. This being the case, the question we must ask is the following. What precisely is at stake in the extension of the biometric border into the human body? And of course, into multiple realms of social life. In other words, what explains the migration from the border understood as a particular point in space to the border as the moving body of the undesired masses of populations. It seems to me that that's the crux of the new migration problem in the world now. And one answer to that question is that, uh, let's see, what we are seeing is a, a new global partitioning between potentially risky bodies versus bodies that are not. And this question of the risky body, of course, uh, the current pandemic has only uh, highlighted it. And it seems to me that just as in terms of what happened in the context of the war on terror, I wouldn't be surprised if in the aftermath of COVID, we see the unleashing of a new generation of technologies 
the aim of which are now uh, to uh, uh, at the center of which in any case, uh, the body in its relationship with other living species will become once again uh, a key target of uh, uh, new forms of, of garden mentality. Um, technology in this case, uh, aiming uh, supposedly uh, to, to fragment the human body in order to, to recompose it for the purpose of securitization, for the purpose of uh, elimination and neutralization of uh, whatever uh, is defined as a, as a risk. And this is happening, I would say, because the human body is still seen as uh, in this age of dematerialization or supposedly, the body is still seen as uh, an indisputable anchor uh, from which data can be safely harnessed and extracted. So uh, what we are witnessing is therefore uh, a gradually extending uh, intertwinement of individual physical char characteristics with information systems, uh, a process that has served uh, to deepen the faith in data as, as a means of risk management and faith in the body as a source of absolute identification. Could go on and on this, uh, but you can see, let's see where uh, uh, I'm uh, heading. Now, in terms of the relocation of the racist animus within various technological devices, part of what is going on is what many have called digital epidermalization is not only that bodies have been turned into data. These data are stored, of course, in, in databases. The management of data-based bodies on the basis of epidermal thinking uh, becoming a generalized mode of thinking, which consists to some extent in the fixation on the phenotypical visible signs of racial uh, difference. And this difference uh, is key to the uh, algorithmic processes through which the body is made biometric. And this is, I think, a very key question. Of course, we still witness forms of racism, the kind we saw in Minneapolis context of the killing of George Floyd. You break the neck. But the breaking of the neck uh, will be in the future, uh, let's say, will, will happen in the future increasingly through uh, technologies. The operations of technologies as I've tried to uh, describe them uh, a moment ago. Now, let me add two other comments and then I will uh, wrap up uh, the uh, presentation. All of what I have described and many other processes are happening in the midst of two shifts in particular, which I think require renewed attention. The first shift relates to the extension of a market logic perspective that addresses life as a commodity, a commodity to be manipulated, replicated under conditions of market volatility. 
That's the first shift. The second shift has to do with, I would say, the shifting distribution of powers between the human and the technological. In the sense that technologies are increasingly moving towards general intelligence and self-replication. In fact, over the last decades, we have witnessed the development of um, algorithmic forms of intelligence, uh, for instance, most of which have been growing in parallel with genetic research and often in alliance with, with it. The integration of algorithms and big data analysis, for instance, in the biological sphere, uh, bringing with it a greater and greater belief in techno-positivism and modes of statistical thought, but also paving the way for uh, regimes of assessment of the natural world and, and modes of prediction and analysis that treat life itself as a computable object. So the turn to treating life as a computable uh, object seems to me to be a very important element uh, in what is going on, since that life itself is increasingly construed by our statistics, uh, metadata modeling, mathematics, and ultimately financial models uh, built on, on technologies of speed, uh, miniaturization, and automation. So the idea that life itself is something that can be calculated, can be recombined, rather than represent, merely represented as was the case, let's say, in, in the uh, old dis dis dispensation. This has led to a bifurcation between life on the one hand and bodies on the other, to the point where nowadays not every body is thought of as containing life. So you have has paved the way for the production of discounted bodies which are believed to contain no life as such. I'll give you an example of discounted bodies. This morning I was reading, I think, The Guardian. This news is that on the coast of Libya last week, more than 100 children trying to cross the Mediterranean have died at sea. These are examples of discounted bodies, by which I mean bodies that are supposed to contain no life as such, since life has become something that is calculable. And something that can be insured. So what we have here, these 100 lives, uh, to some extent, bodies at the limits of, of life. Trapped in an inhabitable world and in hospitable places. And the kind of life they bear or contain clearly is not insured, or if you want, it is an insurable, folded as it is in extreme and thin envelopes. So such bodies, bodies on the precipice, 
are the most exposed to waste and various experiences of effacement or offloading. So what I'm saying is that in the new nomos of the earth, a number of key forces are working to offload the earth of those bodies that are supposed to carry no life as such. Life as such understood as the form of life that can be computed. The kind of life that can be integrated within the strictures of financialization. So that's the first thing, the redistribution of life on differential scales of insurability, non-insurability is a key dimension of contemporary migration regimes. The second thing I want to highlight before I close is the extent to which questions of migration uh, which will dominate or are likely to dominate these centuries debates, the extent to which they have to do with population politics, but population politics at a planetary scale. What I mean by that is that global perspectives on human mobility or what you call migration are increasingly refracted through those of fertility and mortality. Population politics is once again a cipher for broader geo-racial struggles and struggles over the new law of the earth. Okay, we can say that uh, improving the species genetic stock might no longer be the avowed project or sterilizing the, the degenerate, the insane or the criminal might no longer be on the agenda. But treating population as a, a matrix of different races still saturates contemporary global imaginary. And in times of acute racial panic and fears of race suicide, as is the case now, borderization, the erection of borders might be the new form of negative eugenics. And perhaps more than at any moment in our recent past, the population question is framed in terms of weather and how to get rid of certain classes of people deemed redundant or superfluous. What to do with those whose very existence does not seem to be necessary for our reproduction or those whose uh, mere existence or, or proximity is deemed to represent a physical or biological threat to our own life. And in the context of neoliberal governmentality, the incontinent fecundity of the poor or of the inhabitants of the global south is opportunistically resurfacing and is now embedded in existential preoccupations concerning the ecological limits of the earth. The perversion of ecology uh, precisely to advance uh, an agenda uh, that is uh, anti-population. 
I want to highlight that in line with what I have uh, said before. Let me now conclude. Part of what I have tried to do was to put a finger on urgent matters. And behind the term migration, what are those urgent issues we have to deal with? Now, part of what lends weight and urgency to current debates on human mobility in general and the tragedy of precarious bodies in motion is the fact that this is happening or this is intensifying at a time when many are wondering how should we inhabit a new and share as equitably as possible a planet whose life support system has been so severely damaged by human activities and that is in dire need of repair. And Justine was precisely raising those issues in her introduction. Because in view of the, uh, the deep state of fragmentation the planet finds itself in, many are asking, how should we remember it? That is, how should we put it back, put back together its different parts, reassemble it, reconstitute it as an integrated system, a system in which humans and non-humans, physical, chemical, biological components, oceans, atmosphere, are all interlinked in a grand gesture of mutuality or of biosymbiosis. So we have to raise those questions of mobil human mobility within this context. hoping to reinterpret questions of inhabitation and interconnection, questions of mutuality and durability, questions of the interlacing of human history and Earth's history. We have to do that in a context of renewed infatuation with all kinds of borders, the proliferation of borders, intense psychic investment in borders, but also we have to learn how to reinterpret this question of migration of human mobility. Keeping in mind some of the key questions that will dominate this century, two of which, and I'll end there, are life futures and the futures of reason. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Achille, for, for this uh, wonderful uh, talk. We, we, we could uh, uh, hear you uh, more and more. Um, uh, so um, I, I can open the floor um, to questions, uh, maybe to, to uh, let the, the people think. Um, 
about it. Uh, I would have uh, one uh, in particular. So uh, Judith Butler uh, quotes you in two days ago in the time uh, about the pandemic, uh, as she said that the pandemic um, showed us how uh, in inequal we, we are um, uh, facing that crisis, uh, that uh, global crisis. Uh, and she said that a pandemic is a pandemos. I mean, it's, it concern, concerns everyone. Uh, and at the same time, it places as human beings as very vulnerable uh, kind beings uh, on the earth. And it urges us to rethink all places and I think that's something that you have enhanced uh, in your speech right, uh, right now. So um, how how can we do that? And actually she, quote, she quotes you uh, about that. Uh, uh, um, and how can we replace ourselves on the earth? Uh, maybe as you said, through the question of borders and the way we, and the place states, the sovereignty of states. Um, so so I, I would open uh, the floor to question uh, with questions about that, please. It's a very difficult question, uh, as we can see. <laughs> the, um, It's difficult because even before the, uh, the pandemic, um, a number of uh, developments were, were, were going on. Um, developments having to do with a question I, I raised uh, either early on or in, in some other, other context. A question, in fact, that has been there um, at least uh, since the, uh, the 16th century, when, when our world suddenly began to uh, become um, interconnected um, as a result of uh, Europe's exit out of herself and her encounter with uh, the rest of, of the earth. By which uh, I mean at the origins of the colonial project, of which indeed uh, uh, Schmidt uh, talks about. The question was that of ownership of the earth. To whom is it that? the earth belong. And that question has been with us all along, formulated in different ways, especially throughout the uh, history of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And neoliberalism is one way of answering that question. But when we say, to whom is it that the earth belong? We are saying, who shouldn't be here? Who are those who shouldn't be here for one, two, three, four reasons? And what should we do with those who shouldn't be here? Which means, how do we render 
as many people as superfluous as possible. And the novelty with neoliberalism, I would argue, is the production at a massive scale of discounted bodies. Discounted bodies meaning a residual humanity that is akin to waste. And the fact is that with our entry into a new climatic regime, the process will only intensify. And between the 15th, 16th century and now, we have seen indeed many different responses to that question. How do we produce discounted bodies? What do we do with them? How do we treat them? The reserves, the Bantustans, uh, forms of, uh, I would argue, modulated strangulation, here and there, a few genocides, if necessary. The long history of necropolitics. But it seems to me that as the global conditions for the production and reproduction of life on earth keep changing, as I was saying, Population politics at a planetary level will increasingly become synonymous with excess and waste management. And therefore, the kinds of issues Judith Butler has taught us so much about, questions of mutual exposure, questions of vulnerability, questions of precariousness, this will take, um, let's say, uh, a more dramatic turn. In terms of the, uh, the future geopolitics of, of a world in which populations will be more and more treated, not only in the Darwinian terms of uh, um, sexual selection, but also in, in a utilitarian biophysiological organic uh, framework. And I think we will see more and more of this in the aftermath of the pandemic. We already see it in the kind of apartheid that is at work when it comes, for instance, to mm -hmm. the distribution of the sale the, of, of vaccines, uh, for instance. I don't know where you are listening to me from, <laughs> but where <laughs> I am in Johannesburg, we're still waiting for, for vaccine, vaccines. I mean, we, we want to buy them, but I mean, to buy them as South Africa, as Zimbabwe, as Kenya or Nigeria, you have to pay much more than, uh, let's see, uh, if you were buying them as Japan or, or for that matter, the United States of America. There is a question in the chat, and I think you, you partly answered it, so I'm going to read it by Jonathan uh, Kurzweli. Uh, thank you. Uh, he, he said that to what extent do you think the term global apartheid, as used by such scholars as Faye Harrison and Catherine Bestman, is useful to make sense of today's reality? Are the different biometric and militarized movement of controlled technologies of nationalized and racialized body alike the labor passes of apartheid? <clears throat> the, um, 
Look, I mean, that's a metaphor. Uh, it has landed me into trouble here and there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's, it's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was a historical reality, apartheid, South Africa. Uh, outside of South Africa, we can refer to it as uh, a metaphor. What strikes me um, the most today is something I would call techno-molecular colonialism. Uh, maybe it produces new forms of apartheid that we have to uh, look into that. Techno-molecular colonialism, um, I use the term along the lines Margarita Mendes uh, uh, has uh, um, coin, coin, coined it. Uh, uh, a form of colonialism that um, is uh, grounded on uh, new technological innovations or uh, technological innovations on the computational, if you want, on this event, just as Badiou uses the term event, on the computational as an event. Not just a technical system whose function, of course, is to, to capture, to, to extract, to automatically uh, process data that must be identified, that must be selected, sorted, uh, classified, uh, recombined, activated, all of that. But the computational as a new kind of force, but a mutant force. Um, a new kind of uh, energy or an energy of a special kind, but also the computational as, a, as I was trying to argue, uh, a speed regime with its own qualities and infrastructures. And um, a force and energy that produces and serializes subjects, objects, phenomena that splits uh, reason from consciousness and memory, that codes and, and stores data that can be used to manufacture new types of devices sold for profit, while of course operating on bodies, operating on nerves, operating on, on, on material, on blood, on cellular tissues, the brain, and so forth and so on. That is what seems to me to be really what is at stake beyond, let's say, metaphors such as uh, apartheid the conversion of all substances into quantities, which leaves us therefore, since this conference was also devoted to the question of utopia, which leaves us with a number of questions. How to begin to think about that which is not computable, incomputability. How to begin to open up a space for us to think about the incalculable? Is there anything that is so important, so full of value as to be priceless, which means as to escape the strictures of calculation 
of profitability and of computability. To reopen the concept of utopia in times of technological escalation, these are the kinds of issues or questions I think we, we have to mm -hmm. uh, start asking. So, so you, you see, I have gone far beyond the metaphor of apartheid and I, I, I'm now trying to address the second element of the title of the conference, which has to do with, uh, uh, let's see, the, uh, the utopian, the capture of the production of forces and possibilities uh, which escape annexation by the language of machines mm -hmm. or the language of, 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 of contability, mm -hmm. accountancy, and replaces it with that of accountability. Now the move from accountancy to accountability. Thank you. Actually, it, it would have been my, my, my other question uh, about utopia. And um, because one, one might say that uh, reading uh, what you have written about necropolitics and then brutalism, uh, one might say that it's uh, more about despair. And, uh, and, and sometimes I know that you have received a comment saying that it, it, it's, it's in kind depressive. Uh, but I know that you, you also have a lot of... Uh, hope uh, and, uh, and you believe in futures uh, in plural uh, and also futures about Africa uh, as, as I said in the opening uh, as a re-enchantment uh, and also as uh, a place where things uh, might, be, might be imagined for uh, not only for the continent but, but for the whole uh, planet. So, 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 so a question I would have is, is what is utopia? What, what's the, the definition of utopia by Yashin Membe? You see, look, um, it's a bit like, like uh, the, my, my definition of Africa. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not joking at all. Mm -hmm. What strikes me uh, about Africa is that it is two things. And I really don't know how to translate them in English. Uh, but since we are both uh, <laughs> Francophones, and your English is far better than mine, maybe you will do the work of translation. <laughs> it's, for me, Africa is une puissance en réserve. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, une réserve de puissance. So those two things, Mm -hmm. Puissance en réserve and réserve de puissance, that's the definition of utopia. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm not sure I'm you know, translate that in English. You know, your English is far better. But we have our oh, latent power of, and a reserve of power. Thank you, William. A latent power. So William yes, <laughs> William Mills. William Thank translated you. it. Huh? A latent power and a reserve of power would, would you agree with that? I don't know. I prefer to use it in in in, uh, in French. <laughs> in French. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a, a question in the. Yeah, what what that means? Oh, okay. Uh, what it means is that. Let's see. I use those those terms to refer to the um, capacity for self-regeneration, the capacity for mutation and self-regeneration as opposed to natural selection. 
Um, the embrace of life or le vivant, not life, but of le vivant mm -hmm. as itself an open system. An open system meaning non-linear, exponentially chaotic, and uh, yet capable of uh, opening up life to durability. So I'm using here terms I don't really know how to translate in English, but in French, they make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's what utopia for me is. And that's what makes it such that when I write necropolitics or brutalism, it is underpinned by, by this. It is, they are all underpinned by an insurrectionary quality and a deep belief in, for those of you who are, uh, I mean, let me, uh, deep belief in, in, in la force du vivant. It's not just cynicism, nor is it nihilism or pessimism. It's an embrace of the, uh, the drama of, of history. Uh, in its most, uh, uh, in its deepest uh, dimension, as the repository of that which cannot be contained. So, so we we have a question in the chat. Um, um, uh, so, uh, John Stewart uh, are say, uh, is saying, Mao Zedong told Ariana Falacci that it was too early to say whether the French Revolution had an important effect on, on world history. But one take uh, on its uh, values is that freedom without the balances of equality and solidarity becomes license, the right to use power without restraints. What do you think about that? You'll so, have to, to say it yeah. again. Because... Say it again. So, so it was a quotation uh, by Mao Zedong uh, between Mao Zedong and Ariana Falacci. Oh, yeah. um, so Mao Zedong told Ariana Falacci that it was too early to say whether the French Revolution had an important effect on world history. But when one takes it uh, on its value that freedom uh, without the balances of equality and solidarity becomes license, the right to use power without restraint. So I guess it's about the value of freedom, of freedom as a value, um, and to what extent uh, actually it, it, I mean, in the name of freedom, we, we might lose it. I think it's the message. And if John Stewart wants to, to complement what I've said, please do. Okay. Uh, if I can just say uh, hello, Ashil. Uh, John hi, hi, hi. Saudi Arabia. Uh, yes. yeah, it's just the concept that there are three interrelated values of the French Revolution uh, la liberté, l'égalité, la fraternité, but solidarity, I call that. Yes. If you remove equality and solidarity and just leave freedom, it mm. becomes the freedom to use power without restraint. Yes, yes. And that seems to me that uh, you, we need to look at the, how the values interplay and yes. the loss of the values of equality and solidarity are what has allowed, if you like, neoliberal capitalism to use power without restraint. Yes, no, 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 I totally agree with you. I agree with that that uh, uh, take. Um, and, and uh, uh, I totally agree with that. I, and, and the thing is that, uh, of course, uh, there, is a, <clears throat> there was always a, in, in the, um, the French Revolution, 
course, there was a, an element of uh, universalism. The belief was that this was valid, not only for the French uh, nation, but it, it was valid for, for humanity at large, for what they uh, understood as the human race. Um, of course, uh, as we speak, um, uh, the concept of universalism in, in political and ideological battles in France itself uh, uh, has been uh, sometimes perverted, uh, perverted in the sense that uh, <clears throat> the uh, adherence to uh, a form of a vertical abstract universalism has uh, um, uh, uh, opened up uh, the way, the way, uh, the way to uh, to um, all kinds of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, cruel uh, ve ventures, um, uh, colonial violence, uh, and such uh, uh, iterations of uh, uh, non non solidarity, but but. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, liberté, égalité, and solidarity um, are more than ever necessary uh, today uh, if we, we are to uh, uh, foster the emergence of uh, uh, a new planetary consciousness. Um, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the emergence of what I call a new planetary consciousness is much more important uh, today as a value than so-called universalism. Um, thank you, Achille. I, I see that uh, Valeria has a question for you. Valeria was part of the conference. Valeria, please. Uh, your microphone, yes. Yeah, yeah, my microphone is, is on. Uh, do you hear me? Um, I can maybe ask a question in French, if possible. Um, I was thinking, listen to you, I was thinking about another essay of Agamben, La Nuda Homo Sacer, La Nuda Vita et la, la Vie Nue et le Pouvoir, le, le pouvoir Souverain. Alors, je ne sais pas si vous connaissez ce, cet essai, ou pas si il a, il a, pu, il a fait, fait partie de lui, il, il a alimenté votre réflexion, mais je me disais, je voulais vous, vous avoir votre. Votre, votre, voilà, votre sentiment sur ce... À, 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 donc Agamben pense que donc, le couple fondamental de la politique occidentale n'est pas celui d'ami-ennemi, euh, mais plutôt celui de vie nue, existence politique, zoé, bios, donc exclusion, inclusion. Et ce, donc en vous écoutant, j'ai eu l'impression que cela bon, faisait... Donc, ça, 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 ça peut croiser, enfin ce que vous avez très brillamment euh, euh, présenté. Enfin, et voilà, voilà, ma question est vraiment très simple. Est-ce que, est que j'ai bien compris enfin, oh, euh, Est-ce voilà, est que cette, cette, cette réflexion d'Agambe fait partie de votre, de votre... a pu alimenter votre réflexion Et donc, il, est, il, il rappelle la, la, la différence qu'ils faisaient les Grecs entre Zoé et Bios. Zoé était juste la vie la vie naturelle, la vie commune à tous les êtres vivants, alors que Zoé, c'est vraiment la vie politique. Donc la vie, donc, euh, euh, il disait, euh, euh, donc, il, 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 donc Aristote parlait de, de bios théoréticos ou bios politicos, hein, et n'aurait jamais pu parler en termes de Zoé, euh, voilà, qui implique simplement la, la, vie, la vie naturelle, la seule vie naturelle. Voilà, 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 je m'arrête. <rire> Okay. Écoutez, j'aime beaucoup euh, Giorgio, euh, je le lis, hein, je lis tout ce qu'il écrit. Euh, oui. Le, le, le seul petit problème avec Giorgio, c'est que euh, mm -hmm. il, il ne sort jamais de, de son musée. Il ne sort jamais de son musée, c'est-à-dire que il, euh, 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 il ne cherche pas à profiter de ce que je pourrais appeler la bibliothèque planétaire. Mmh. Um, 
il sait très bien utiliser sa bibliothèque, qui est la bibliothèque occidentale, si, si vous voulez. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mais il ne sort pas de la bibliothèque occidentale. Je ne veux pas dire que la bibliothèque occidentale est inutile, loin de là. Et en fait, le grand intérêt de la bibliothèque occidentale, c'est qu'elle n'appartient pas uniquement à l'Occident. Bien sûr. Elle ne lui appartient pas uniquement dans le sens où d'autres ont contribué à sa formation, mm -hmm. mais aussi dans le sens où d'autres ont profité de cette bibliothèque. Au point mm -hmm. où on, il est difficile aujourd'hui de dire où elle s'arrête. Mm -hmm. Et dans ce sens-là, elle est absolument essentielle pour la réflexion sur le monde contemporain. Mais elle n'est pas suffisante. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oui. Et j'aimerais bien qu'à euh, un moment donné, Giorgio, il s'intéresse mm -hmm. aux autres bibliothèques. Oui, <rire> je comprends. Je comprends donc, tout à fait, oui. Et donc, moi, moi je veux bien que la division fondamentale euh, d'origine aristotélienne soit celle que il, il indique, c'est-à-dire la différence entre Zoé et Bios. Mm -hmm. Mais je crois qu'elle n'est pas la seule, y compris dans la tradition occidentale. Il y en a d'autres dans la tradition occidentale. Vous avez évoqué Schmitt, euh, ami et ennemi. On pourrait penser à d'autres également. La grande différence, à mon sens, que l'on retrouve notamment dans la phénoménologie allemande, même dans l'existentialisme français, la grande différence entre l'être et le non-être. Qu'il s'agisse de Heidegger, euh, l'être et le temps, euh, de Sartre, euh, ils sont nombreux comme ça à avoir euh, théorisé justement cette euh, euh, grande division entre ce qui est et ce qui n'est pas. Et en fait, si on relit l'histoire occidentale à partir du dehors, je veux dire des phénomènes historiques comme la traite des esclaves, comme la colonisation, et ainsi de suite, c'est ça la grande différence entre l'être et le non-être. Alors que en Afrique, par exemple, disons dans les systèmes de pensée euh, précoloniaux en Afrique, la question de l'être, la question ontologique, elle n'est pas la plus importante. Ce qui est important, c'est la question du devenir, parce que, au fond, il n'y a pas d'essence. Il y a un devenir. Euh, et puisque je suis à Taïwan, je vous interromps un moment, ce que je suis à Taïwan, en fait, c'est la philosophie orientale, en fait, c'est plutôt la relation même encore. C'est la, la même chose en Afrique. C'est la même chose. Bien entendu, c'est la même chose. Et donc, moi, je veux bien travailler avec euh, la distinction zo et bios, mais encore faut-il euh, la, la réinterpréter à partir d'autres disons, d'autres traditions, euh, dont je ne la rejette pas, mais je pense qu'on peut l'enrichir en l'exposant à hein, d'autres catégories euh, de pensée. Et c'est ainsi qu'on va, euh, je dirais, euh, faire surgir une pensée planétaire à, à, à la place d'une pensée, la pensée d'une seule des provinces du monde. C'est comme ça qu'on va déprovincialiser la pensée à un moment de notre histoire commune où on a besoin de penser le commun ou l'en commun. Mais juste pour le défendre un instant, il, quand il parle de singularité quelconque, quand même il essaye de, de, de donner cette ouverture que vous, 
voilà, qui, lui, qui à, à votre avis, lui manque, en fait. Je pense que dans ce concept de singularité quelconque, il arrive à introduire cela, en fait, à donner cette ouverture à sa pensée. Mais ce Je ne sais pas mieux. si vous êtes d'accord. Ce serait mieux, <rire> quand même, <rire> s'il sortait de son musée. <rire> We we have in the in the chat uh, we have the chat in, in the chat in a question for you. Sorry, so Spivak. Uh, so it's a question by. It's a question by. Wait, wait. By Kishore Birdi, uh, Birdika, Spivak suggests the idea of complicity being folded together. We are complicit in each other's lives, in precarity, subalternities, migrants, but also rich people. So the question is, can we politicize the idea of complicity? How can we imagine complicity? Kishore, if you want to join us, please do. Yeah, hi. This is Kishore. Hi. So I was thinking of this idea of complicity. In, I'm, I'm speaking from India in Mumbai, and we hardly see any politics which uh, crosses class barriers. There is such a strict regime of uh, which politics, kind of politics we do. And this idea of that we are folded together, it, it's coming strongly in, in the pandemic now. But we don't see how it can be, uh, I wanted to understand how can it be kind of politicized and how can we think of, uh, of, of new politics of, uh, of, uh, with complicity as, 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 as not being responsible for the lives of, of children's deaths that you mentioned, but I'm complicit in it in certain ways not directly responsible, but I'm complicit in, in, in this. So how, how can we imagine that uh, this idea to, to enter into minds of people? So that, that's broadly the, the question of I had. Yes, uh, yes. it's a very difficult question, uh, uh, Kishore. Yeah. Um, I'm also struggling with the idea of how to think about it. Yes. Uh, here in South Africa, there have been a number of um, um, attempts at um, um, undertaking a, a political reading of, of complicity. Mm -hmm. um, but here, I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. I'm just giving an example of how Let's see, uh, in this particular case, uh, the mm -hmm. issue has been uh, dealt with. Um, the question of complicity has been raised in the context of the crimes committed under apartheid. Okay. So, so the, the concept um, <clears throat> has been um, uh, addressed uh, in relation to, 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 uh, Uh, the involvement uh, mm -hmm. in um, a terrible crime uh, of uh, uh, people who uh, otherwise uh, uh, might have wanted to um, uh, claim innocence uh, in the face of uh, the catastrophe that happened. Okay. Um, So the question of complicity or innocence as uh, a cipher for that of, of responsibility, uh, mm -hmm. responsibility and therefore uh, accountability. Questions of, of justice, uh, of punishment eventually, uh, mm -hmm. and of reparation. Mm -hmm. um, so so, so um, that has been one way in which uh, this has been dealt with. The idea that uh, we are, some of us have been victims, but uh, others have been complicit uh, 
uh, in the sense that they uh, didn't want to see, they uh, didn't want to uh, feel any uh, empathy with uh, those who were being uh, uh, subjected to uh, inhuman, uh, inhuman uh, acts, um, in the sense that uh, they benefited uh, from uh, uh, a structure, uh, an unjust structure uh, that that was put in place uh, and, and rested fundamentally on uh, the wasting of of other people's lives. Uh, so 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 that has been the way in which question of complicity has been addressed. Yes. There have been a second uh, way which has to do with the um, the idea that uh, under apartheid um, there there was a, a, let's say the perpetrators um, ended up. Um, being damaged. That not only the victims were damaged, the perpetrators okay. were also damaged. Okay. Both not exactly at the same same level or same extent, uh, whatever, but that there's a kind of mutuality, negative mutuality, uh, complicity as negative mutuality, uh, and that to to get out of that uh, and and rebuild repair uh, South African society, uh, the damage suffered by the victims uh, uh, is, is not enough to only focus on them. One also has to focus on the damage suffered by those who indeed uh, were responsible, direct responsible of the uh, that's far That's as far as I can see, but it's not an issue I have studied myself okay. because we think in indian context we think of caste and caste and the the activism of ambedkar and uh, his connection with du bois and how they kind of looked at the whole question of race and caste here caste specifically in india and then we kind of think now the because the identity politics that gets built up in response to this is also problematic because the identity politics ultimately ends up supporting few of the 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 vanguards and few of the leaders of the of the identity and the real subaltern never get supported so that's the problem with with the question of identity so i was wondering that how do we think of politics that is beyond identitarian identitarian interests and how does complicity, can complicity kind of be used in that way to, to think beyond identitarian politics? Because it has its own, own limits, whether it's question of race or whether it's question of, of caste. And, and, and I'm struggling with this, this and how do we think of, of new politics? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um... Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we should uh, con conclude here, uh, if you agree, Achille. Uh, thank, I, I want to, to, to thank you and to say how grateful we are uh, that you, you answer positively to our invitation uh, for such you know, topical themes, uh, which are uh, utopia and migration. So a huge thank you. I wish <laughs> you would be you you would be here in Oxford, uh, and I could invite you, you know, to have a Belgian beer in a in a, in a British pub. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know how much you you might uh, appreciate that. So uh, I would say that. It will be for another time uh, and soon, hopefully. Uh, so thank you also everyone uh, who has been uh, here uh, today with us. Um, um, I, I would like to, to conclude now the, this conference in French as it was bilingual. 
j'aimerais maintenant conclure en, en français cette, 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 ce, ce colloque Utopie et Migration qui a eu lieu sur une semaine, une semaine très intense de rencontres Zoom quotidiennes. Euh, nous avons donc eu le plaisir d'avoir des échanges extrêmement, extrêmement riches et ce n'est certainement pas la fin. Alors c'est empli d'espoir et de cette émotion intellectuelle dont je vous parlais que je tiens à remercier l'ensemble des participantes et participants à ce colloque. Merci pour la rencontre d'idées nouvelles ou du moins renouvelées, l'ouverture des échanges et la disponibilité d'esprit à une période où, où le désespoir est, est tentant, où le désespoir se pointe dans la solitude de nos écrans aussi. Alors j'aimerais remercier mes complices Sabrina Parent et Véronique Bragard. Merci à elles deux. Je sais à quel point cette semaine a été difficile aussi pour elles, euh, vu la charge de cours et la charge administrative qu'elles ont. Merci à Pascal Marty, Anne-Sophie Gabias, Catherine Osevivan, Robin Ropport et John Pretorius, qui sont l'équipe, euh, qui constitue l'équipe de la Maison française d'Oxford, qui a eu la gentillesse de nous accueillir sur cette plateforme virtuelle. Navré que nous n'ayons pu accueillir que 100 participants. Ça a été même problématique pour accueillir <rire> notre, notre invité principal. Euh, Navré, ça, ça, ce n'était pas prévu. Euh, J'aimerais aussi remercier Mathieu Reynolds, remercier les bailleurs de fonds que sont Wolfson College, OCCT Research Center, l'Université libre de Bruxelles, l'Université catholique de Louvain et la haute école Robert Schumann. Merci aux personnes qui sont venues enrichir nos discussions grâce à la portée des réseaux. Ceci n'est pas un au revoir, puisqu'une nou nouvelle étape euh, nous réunira à l'occasion de la publication en volume des actes au sujet de laquelle nous vous contacterons très bientôt. Ce n'est pas non plus un au revoir, parce que je vous le dis déjà, <rire> étant resté sur ma fin, il y aura une seconde édition de, de ce colloque et en présentiel. Je ne sais pas encore où dans le monde, mais croyez-moi, ça aura lieu. Merci et à bientôt.